Welcome to the online church service for Galesville United Methodist Church. We hope you enjoy the service. We have one announcement this morning, and uh, the Department of uh, Aging is offering a free lunch from our parking lot on August 12th and August 19th. The giveaway will begin at 11 a.m., but you do need to sign up ahead of time. Um, all of the information is on our web page and on our Facebook page, and I, I have flyers. Um, I, I'll be sending out a general email, but let everybody know in South County that's over 60 years old that they're entitled to sign up for a free lunch. It's being prepared by Harrington Harbor, so um, it should be pretty good. So that's August 12th and August 19th. Good morning, everyone. Dave Loft is here again with more anniversaries and birthdays. We have no anniversaries this week, but we do have five birthdays. Frank McDonald, Brendan Gay, Madeline Hunt, Susan Bonds, and Edie Cassidy. So let's sing happy birthday to all those people. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Jesus loves you. Happy birthday to you. Okay, thank you everyone. See you again next week with more birthdays and anniversaries. Please join me in the call to worship. Lord, be with us throughout these summer days. Guide us in your paths of service. Dance with us on the days of joy. Reach out to us when we are fearful. Dear friends, Jesus is our guide and our pilot. No matter how rough the seas, Jesus brings us hope and peace. Amen. <laughs>
God of mysterious ways, you take our fears and turn them into triumphs. You remind us that you are always with us and that we do not need to fear the wind and the waves of life. Encourage us to step out of the boat, to come across these difficulties to your redeeming and transforming love. Give us courage and strength, joy and peace for all these times ahead. Amen. Good morning. At this time, we'll lift up our joys and, and remember those that need to be remembered in prayer. And of course, we, uh, we continue to pray for Shirley, um, the family of Richard Collinson. He, he died last week. Um, the Frame family was able to move into a, a rental home until their home can be uh, redone. Uh, Robert, we still want to keep in our prayers in need of a heart transplant. And the family of Jean Trot. So let's, let's go to God in prayer. As the summer days move rapidly toward the busyness of autumn, our attention is drawn forward. We begin to think about what should be coming, children preparing for the new virtual school year, young people off to service, work, or college, return to regular work schedules, preparations for retirement. Help us to adjust to change as we continue to prevent the spread of the virus. There are so many things looming on our horizons that our focus is placed on them. Be with us, loving God. Remind us to place our focus on Jesus, who calls us to trust in his mercy and care. Keep the needs of others in our hearts and minds, needs for healing, for comfort, for friendship. Help us to reach out to them and offer our gifts and service in your name. This morning we especially want to remember Shirley recovering from surgery, the family of Richard Collinson, the Frame family, Robert, the Jean Trott family, and Allison McKim. We name these dear ones with our voices and in our hearts to you. In these next moments of silence, we can offer up those whose names have not been lifted out loud. As you have loved and healed us, so we ask your healing mercies on these whom we have named. And we also ask your guidance and patience with us as we march through the last weeks of summer, confident in Jesus' love for, the, for us. All these things we ask in Jesus' name, who taught us to say when we pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you. 
gospel lesson for today is from Mark chapter 8, verses 34 to 37. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Um, our lectionary gospel lesson this morning is from Matthew chapter 14, verses 22 through 23. Right then, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go ahead to the other side of the lake while he dismissed the crowds. When he sent them away, he went up on a mountain by himself to pray. Evening came, and he was alone. Meanwhile, the boat, fighting a strong headwind, was being battered by the waves and was already far away from the land. Very early in the morning, he came to his disciples walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified and said, It's a ghost! They were so frightened, they screamed. Just then, Jesus spoke to them, Be encouraged. It's me. Don't be afraid. Peter replied, Lord, if it's you, order me to come to you on the water. And Jesus said, Come. Then Peter got out of the boat and was walking on the water toward Jesus. But when Peter saw the strong wind, he became frightened. And as he began to sink, he shouted, Lord, rescue me. Jesus immediately reached out and grabbed him, saying, You man of weak faith, why did you begin to have doubts? When they got into the boat, the wind settled down. Then those in the boat worshipped Jesus and said, You must be God's son. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. I can remember shopping at Montgomery Ward before there was even an Annapolis Mall. I was in the clothing department with Woody and Matt, and the boys seemed to love hiding in the clothing racks, especially the round ones. Well, you can guess what happened. I couldn't find Matt. That's a very scary feeling. I've lost Matt. Words can't describe what happened in my heart at that moment. And just as this was sinking in, from under a clothing rack walked Matt. Not a care in the world, as if to say, I know exactly where I am. But for a split second, 
I thought I had lost him. As we continue our Finding God and Family Friendly movie sermon series, series, we're looking today at another story about being lost, Finding Nemo. So far in this series, we've talked about Lion King, Up, Mr. Magoo's Christmas Carol, and we've learned about God's creation and the circle of life and the importance of loving others and how we can be transformed. Oh, and I almost forgot it. I began writing the sermon before I preached about Cinderella. How envy can destroy us. Are we talking about a bunch of kids' movies or the Bible? Powerful stuff. The theme of being lost should resonate with those of us who follow Jesus because he gives us plenty of examples of what God does when we're lost. He tells the parable of how the shepherd leaves behind the 99 other sheep to find the lost one. He tells the story of the woman, the woman who loses the coin and searches frantically until she finds it. And he wraps up his trilogy with the story of the prodigal son, the lost boy, who is lavishly welcomed home by the father, who says, we had to celebrate and rejoice because he was lost and now he's found. Marlon also knows what it's like to lose someone. Marlon is a clownfish who has the unfortunate, unfortunate personality trait of not being very funny. Instead, he's incredibly anxious, a constant worrier. When Marlon was younger, his wife and 399 babies were eaten by a barracuda, leaving only Marlon and his son Nemo. As you can guess, Marlon is incredibly protective of Nemo, to the point that Nemo begins to resent Marlon's helicopter parenting. On Nemo's first day of school, Marlon accompanies him to class and follows closely as they take a field trip. Nemo, in an effort to assert his independence, ventures beyond the safe zone and is captured by a scuba diver who wants to add Nemo to his exotic fish collection. Marlon's worst fears are confirmed, and now he has to leave the safety of his comfort zone to find Nemo. Nemo's capture highlights for Marlon the brutal truth of being a parent or loving any child. And that is from the moment a child is born and that umbilical cord is cut, we are forced to participate in the painful practice of letting them go. They take their first steps away from us. They say, mine, for the first time. They get on their first school bus or move into their first dorm room. The art of parenting a loving child is the art of learning to let go. When I was director at Parkwood Learning Center, the first day of preschool was harder on the parents than it was on the students. The teachers dealt with the kids, and I carried a box of Kleenex to help comfort the parents. Letting go. Letting our children become their own people, entrusting them to others, can be really hard. God knows about this, right? From the very, very beginning, God gave his children, Adam and Eve, the freedom to do what they wanted, even if it meant not doing what God wanted them to do. And ever since then, we've been testing our limits with God, pushing the envelope, asserting our independence by defying God, running away from God, doing the exact opposite of God, what God wants us to do. Have you run away from God? I know I have, but God never stops chasing us, never gives up on us. Once Nemo is taken, Marlon has to decide what to do, maintain the control over his life that he craves, or to let go of it in order to venture into the dark, murky, unknown ocean to find his son. Of course, he chooses to find Nemo. Along the way, he meets Dory, a flighty fish with a short-term memory problem. Dory joins the hunt for Nemo, doing her best to help Marlin, 
by speaking to whales and sacrificing herself in a swarm of jellyfish. And yet, because he is such a control freak, Marlon can't fully put his trust in her, actually sending her away because he thinks she's slowing him down. Deep down, Marlon's problem is not with Dory, it's with himself. He believes the only person to blame for his trouble is himself. First he lost his wife and babies because he didn't do enough to save them, and now he's lost Nemo. He's a failure. If he could have just tried harder, if he could have just exerted more control, things would have been better. He says to Dory, I promised I would never let anything happen to him. And Dory, in all her wisdom, says, that's a funny promise. If you never let anything happen to him, then nothing will ever happen to him. The pivotal moment in the movie comes when Dory and Marlon are swallowed by a whale. Sounds a bit like Jonah, huh? Marlon is afraid they will be eaten, but Dory, using her ability to speak to whales, learns that they have to go to the back of the whale's throat in order to escape. Dory tells him, it's time to let go. Marlon asks, how do you know something bad isn't going to happen? Dory responds, I don't. That's about the best sermon I could ever pre preach right here. How do you know something bad isn't going to happen? I don't, but I know, do know that God is with us when we let go. The security God offers is not a promise of what won't happen, but a promise of what will happen, that God will be with us at all times, even in the darkest valleys. And we find freedom when we're able to let go of the things we can't control and trust that God is with us on the journey. Marlon eventually does let go, dropping down into the whale's throat only to be resurrected through the blowhole and back into the sea. What was it Jesus said? For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. From that point on, he's a changed fish. No longer held back by his fears, he courageously seeks out Nemo, not afraid of riding a current on the back of a sea turtle or enlisting the help of sharks and seagulls. He learns that dark, murky ocean is also teeming with colorful, joyful life. For the first time, Marlin relies on others to help him. He gives up his control and in the process saves Nemo's life. Marlin learns the blessing of a life lived in faith, the paradox that security is found not in control, but in surrender. The more we're willing to surrender our lives into God's hands, to trust that God walks with us, the more we find peace in the fact that it's not up to us. God walks with us in the delivery room, onto the bus for the first day of school, into the hospital, into the lawyer's office, and into the belly of a whale. And if God walks with us into these situations, God has the power to bring resurrection out of them. In what part of life are we holding on to too tightly? What do we need to do to let go in order to experience the blessing God has for us? What new realm are we being called to explore? A new relationship, a new job, a new leadership position? Remember, God goes with you. Here's the thing. Trying to control our lives, we're not very good at it. Have you noticed that? We weren't uh, created to be in control. And Adam and Eve, or the Israelites, just ask them. Or just about anyone who's ever lived. We are most fully ourselves 
when we surrender ourselves to our faith in God. But how do we know something bad isn't going to happen? We don't. For those who want to save their life will lose it. But those who lose their lives for my sake, for the sake of the gospel, will save it. So do we just play it safe? Or do we venture into the dark, murky, unknown future, a future that's also teeming with new life? When Marlon did, he found Nemo. I wonder what we'll find there. Amen. join me in the benediction. You have been embraced by the love of God, empowered by the Spirit, and blessed by Jesus to go into this world to offer healing and hope. Go in peace. Amen.